Welcome back, everybody, to your daily update on the state of the Malazan Empire. And um, we're back with the last part of Book 2 of Midnight Tide's Prowse of the Day. But before we get into that, um, I wanted to say that I've seen there's been a lot of comments of some of my recent videos, and I did not ignore them on purpose. The problem is that right now, for whatever reason, um, YouTube comments aren't loading on my computer. Um, I've tried different browsers. It seems like an issue with my screen reading software. So um, I can't actually write long and thoughtful comments there because I wouldn't need to do all of that on my phone, which frankly is terrible. <laughs> because I don't know if any of you have ever tried to use voiceover on an iPhone and type with it. It takes ages and I'm not a very patient person. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really sorry about that. I would really love to answer a lot about the, the, the gaming hard magic system stuff and maybe even more about some other stuff. But, you know, I'm right now I can't. I'm really hoping like every day that with the next browser update or whatever tech update, maybe the comments will come back. But right now I don't know what to do. So I'm, I'm reading comments and I'll try to do like short comment, like short answers on my phone. But if it's like something really thoughtful, then I'm right now I need to figure a way out a way to actually do that in a proper way. Um, if you have any suggestions for that, let me know. So um, that's like the first thing. The other thing is I was like thinking um, to maybe switch it up a bit and do like one uh, video per like during the weekdays that's not about or maybe on the weekends I don't know that's not Malazan but or, or not Malazan read through that would be about Discworld I've seen there's a lot of Discworld stuff going on in um, booktube in general right now and I've read all of those Discworld novels like somewhere between two and ten times at this point, maybe even more than ten times for something like Color of Magic. And I don't know, it, feel, it feels like, like a shame for me not to do something at the moment, like everyone is doing about that. I would probably not do reviews because you don't need another Discworld review at this point. We know those books, like we should know those books. They've been out for like 30, 40 years at this point. So it would be more of a, um, I don't know, introduction slash how to read that book, what to expect from that kind of book, um, how to appreciate it best, which I feel is something that might be important for the older books like Color of Magic, um, Light Fantastic, Equal Rights. Those ones that are a bit, more difficult to get into if you have not, you know, read a lot of other stuff before and, you know, might be a bit harder to get into or get a lot of like more harsher criticism from people who are new to Discworld. So that would be like my idea to do like one Discworld book per week. Because, yeah, I mean, I, I've read those so many times. It can basically, I could basically do that right now without any preparation. So if I figured that might be a good idea. Let me know if you would like that and I'll consider it. But now let's get into Midnight Tides, okay? Well, cheers. And what do we have? We have a lot of interesting stuff going on in those last two chapters that I feel we should talk about. So um, let's first talk a bit about the um, stuff going on in Letheras before we return to the um, before we turn return to the Tist Edur and what's going on there. I feel that's the better way to go about it, especially since, like, if you go through the book, chapter ten is Letheras, chapter eleven is back with a. Uh, is back with the Edur and what's going on there. So, what is there? Like, first of all, the mini heist story in there is cool with Shurk Elal going there, uh, like Shurk Elal and um, going going a thieving in uh, that house. That's just like a, as a mini exercise in how to write a an interesting heist story. It's just well done. 
It's also like the way it's described shows, in my opinion, once again, the the, the gaming backgrounds. Like if you've ever played any kind of Dungeons and Dragons, um, like pen and paper role playing game and heist or break in into like a house, that's very similar to that in a way. Um, with all the wards and stuff like that. that. That's how I, as a dungeon master, would secure a house, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> I'm not sure if any of that's like, a viable way to actually protect your house in a magical environment. I'm not that kind of person. Um, but just that. The other thing, obviously, is the the slightly absurd tone of that as well, which um, leads us up to the... Um, leads us up to what I wanted to talk about a bit more, which is, once again, sexuality and how it's depicted. Um, which obviously is the situation with um, first Ublala Pung and then also with um, Shurk Elal. Now, I've said this before, that within Letheras, um, Ericsson plays a lot with the way sexuality is um, depicted in a lot of media and turns a lot of that up on its head. We have next instance of that with Ublala Pang um, sitting there in Tehol's house and being distraught because he's only used as a sex object by um, the three um, um, business partners of Tehol there. And the way it's depicted is totally over the top, but if you like, you know, step back a bit and look at how Things like that were depicted in classic Hollywood comedies of the 1950s or whatever and like older literature and just gender switch it and gender swap it and you have... It's a uncomfortably accurate um, depiction just, you know, made slightly absurd um, by um, the um, sex object being Ublala Pang, who is then at the same point, um, depicted as this emotionally vulnerable um, person. Now that's... I feel... I, I enjoy it quite a lot. It's a lot of fun. It's just interesting to see how these all these other things that um, are... Some other authors would just use for like their own thing, their own like shorter novel parody or whatever, are all woven into Malazan. I said this before that the Malazan Book of the Fallen is like this huge tapestry of different strands, and this goes for the plot, but this also goes for all these um, different elements. Um, uh, yesterday, um, a critical dragon made this video on the path of hands and the horror elements within Dead House Gates. And this kind of speaks to the same thing there. It's like the Malazan Book of the Fallen is this huge, sprawling thing where there's room for comedy or horror in there that are just like these small, I don't want to say miniatures, but it's sort of like a miniature of how to do this, how to do that. And here, here's, horror, here's a bit of body horror for you. Here's a bit of um, urban fantasy um slash, um, I don't want to say romantic comedy, but that kind of thing here for you. There's Here's a heist story for you. All of these small things that we see um, find their place within this sprawling epic work that has an overarching theme. And all these small things, these smaller subplots, sub-stories with their own atmosphere being in there as well. And that's just something that makes Malazan so special for me is like among other things is just yes you have all these small other things it takes from so many different aspects of literature that it you can find something to tickle your fancy in there depending on which book you're looking at and that's cool that's just something that not that many books that I have read manage over time I would say yeah, you know, Banks Culture Series does that, but they, those are like standalone novels set in like one universe and not an over like ongoing narrative because there is an ongoing story within the Malazan Book of the Fallen, obviously. <clears throat> so there's that, um, which I think makes Malazan very unique. 
Not, yeah, okay, when you go to the fantasy genre, speaking of it, Discworld obviously does something similar. And in a way, obviously, also, um, people like China Mieville and um, Joe Abercrombie have tried something similar. Abercrombie with his standalone novels, where he basically sets a war novel and a, um, you know, um, mob drama, revenge story and a western in his like world but once again those are individual novels not with an ongoing narrative and that's something that i find very interesting how erickson manages to pull that off and also how well he manages to pull that off that's just like hugely impressive for me Yes, what else? Um, the instance, the situation with, uh, where Bryce Betty comes back to see the Kurukan who is hanging upside down looking at those maps to mathematically prove that the world is round. That one is a very interesting scene indeed for several reasons. Like the first of all, in what uh what we see there the experiment that he's basically comedically recreating is cool of him hanging down so he has, sees those forces of him moving and um on the other hand him hanging upside down to prove that there's uh, the rotation of the planet and the the gravitational forces to prove those which is cool because it's you know it's sort of a homage to how we actually experimentally proved those things back in the day. The other thing is obviously when he looks at the map and realizes that all these continents were once together in like one continent that then were cracked up by what we obviously would call continental drift. Now, if those are, if the, that is continental drift or something else within the Malazan universe is a different question. But what the overall scene establishes is that up, at least up to a certain point, the general rules of physics and science and natural science that we know from our world and our lives and our reality apply to the Malazan world. Obviously, all continents were one continent. Now, did they shatter when the when the crippled god broke uh, fell down? Um, I would say no, because Memories of Ice tells us that, like in the prologue of Memories of Ice, they're already talking about different continents. So no. So apparently the idea of continental drift, um, similar to um, our, um, you know, um, real world kind of is the same. So you have your, like, whatever it's going to be, whatever it was called, supercontinent, Pangea kind of thing, Pangea um, kind of thing in um, Malazan and this is what I mean by um, like with a lot of whole lot of other details. Every time when he when Erickson goes and describes these um, different like geolo geological um, things, when he does like larger la landscape descriptions, he he always goes into like these details about um, how different like strata of rock are piled and where you see the remainders of glaciers and stuff like that. It is done, which, you know, gives us a reason to understand or gives us ways to understand that the overall rules of the universe, like the physics of the universe, are similar or the same to ours. And um, to make, make us understand that in a way by showing us people who discover those rules anew or rediscover those rules within the world, is an is a better way or like a more uh, immersive way to show us that than would um, the um, be a just an info dump or whatever. So that's just like a way where we can like I guess we mostly when we read fantasy novels unless it's explicitly stated that something is different from our world, unless that is explicitly stated, um, we basically always assume that like 
general things work like in our world because that's the easiest way when you you just fill in all those holes in in the world building with your experience that's how we do that kind of thing um but to have it like reaffirmed just makes it at least for me makes it feel more real it's like i usually don't think about glaciation and um things like that or continental drift it's not on my mind every waking moment is i basically ignore it most of the time which is you know how we all most of us do that <laughs> i suspect um but um so we don't really miss it when we read a book and it's not mentioned specifically when we read a fantasy novel and there's nothing spoken about continental drift we're like yeah well feels like our world um but for me at least it's like when it comes up in this small tidbit here you're like ooh, this feels realer than like other worlds in a way it feels realer is realer even a word more real it feels more real is what i'm trying to say and that's just you know one of those situations where i feel that erickson manages to do much more than just give us a like short interesting scene with a bit of funny like um enjoyable dialogue and uh, some information on the top of that or uh, which obviously we could take that scene and interpret it about in a lot of like ways that people who study literature would do but i feel it's inter interesting to point out that those scenes often also just serve to make to give the world building depth in a way by just re-establishing that yes certain rules apply to this world All right, what else um, to talk about this part? Um, well, we get more palace, palace intrigue. We um, finally get a first conversation with um, the um, with the first um, first concubine, not first concubine. What's his name? Consort. First consort. Yes, we get a first actual conversation with the first consort. We get a very, very, very cheeky line of our good friend Kuru Khan to a Bryce about um, the uh, the first consort when he calls him a very a, a, an errant boy. And I will not elaborate on that because it doesn't pay now, but like a book later you will understand why this is just i mean you read that the second time and i read that the second time and i kind of overlooked it i read it the third time and i'm like damn you erics and damn you for making that terrible joke anyway um on to something else that i find interesting um that being, we get a lot of, like, ideas of how um, we get more, in, like, information shown about the, the city. <laughs> that new mystery with how many people disappear or die within Letheras when Tehol hears that conversation between Shurk Elal and Oblala Pang about the bodies in the canals and... That's definitely something to keep an eye on in the future because it very much shows in a way how Teho as a character works because he's, yes, he's that criminal mastermind, smart, economic, economically smart, ruthless bastard. And that's cool. But it's... He is that because he's interested in everything and he's open to all kinds of influences and interests and not too single-mindedly focused on so on one thing and that's a very um ha what i feel a very a more realistic depiction of like really intelligent people from my experience um in a way is that they are at least people that um are um not just, you know, focused on, not just good at one thing, and Tehol is not just good at one thing, as far as we know, <clears throat> is that 
it's very much about the interest and being able to be interested in all kinds of random things and not just single-mindedly focused on monetary gain or whatever. Um, I just found that interesting. It's um, something to keep in mind to see how, how these small details then sometimes lead to something and sometimes don't. It's not like every plot thread within the Malazan Book of the Fallen gets resolved at the end. It's not everything gets resolved. Sometimes things just happen. And sometimes things are just interesting, interesting things <laughs> and nothing more. Okay, what uh, what more is there? I mean, the, the things at the um, dying Azath house, we now know that the Azath house is dead. It has apparently died. We hear that through Kettle. Um, cool thing. Uh, no, not cool, but something's gonna happen there. She has apparently found a um, protector. It also, you know, kind of explains a certain ghost that we have met that has shown up twice in the Edur lands, right? Because remember that um, Silcha's ruin was deposited in the Azath house on this continent? And remember his depiction from the prologue? Yeah. That's sort of leading up to something, I feel. I feel. But speaking of ghosts within the Lethra, uh, within the Tist Edur country, um, yeah, there is a lot goes on there as well. We have our first like meeting with Morok Nevas and um, see the prince and like when the when the delegation shows up. And I'm not, um, you know, I might well. I'm not going to go again and say, like, those seem unrealistically stupid people, especially the prince, because, no, they're realistically stupid people. They're just stupid, arrogant people out there. And so far, he's not going over the top there. Um, more interestingly is obviously the dy the dynamics within the Edors, the Edor with um, Rulat Sengar taking over. There's something there that we need to keep an eye on. Remember last time, like yesterday, I spoke about Rulad being flawed or becoming, or his flaws becoming more pronounced while they travel. Now, and, and how um, the character, like the people, the crippled god he uses need to be flawed in a way. But we see those flaws once again. And there's an interesting thing... Uh, um, to keep in mind there when we see how Rulat sometimes behaves, um, especially when he takes Mayan there and is just like his vicious young kid self, basically. Although there might, once again, there's this like small sense with familiarity. It's like, I still don't know whether Mayan and Rulat had something going on there before he just requests her as a um, as the emperor but anyway the point there is that troll senga realized that rulad is more than before and less than before and still himself there and we'll see if those tensions between the burden of being the emperor of the Le uh, of the edor and being the emperor and um, being the chosen one of the crippled god and on the other hand being a still not very adult child with his um with all the flaws of a youngest son who is kind of spoiled or feels kind of spoiled and feels on the other hand that he has to prove himself all the time well, these if these flaws if the tensions that are created by these flaws how they develop over time is going to be something to look at because one thing that we have learned so far i feel within the malazan book of the fallen is that the villains or the Dangerous people. Let's call them dangerous people for now. Um, and Rulat is surely becoming a villain or at least a dangerous person there. They are very, very human indeed. They're not your cookie-cutter villains. It's very important to see all the flaws within those. They're not, you know, anti-heroes anti or anything. They're 
they are oftentimes very evil or highly problematic, commit crimes uh, like by the bucket, right? They do that. But there's it's still, I feel, important to look at why people become who they are and how and to look for their humanity and their yes, their inner humanity. And I feel Rulat is like the next one we need to look at for that. Because there is certainly humanity in there. And there might be I might find pity in myself for him. I, I certainly can pity, you know, the Panion seer, even though he does absolutely horrific things. But, you know, there is still that, that seed in there of why he did what he did, and I can certainly find some compassion for him. And I feel like while reading and knowing what we know about the Malazan Book of the Fallen and com compassion and empathy being those these important things there, um, these important themes of the book. I feel it's an interesting exercise to, not an interesting, but it's a very important exercise to while reading and reading about those villains to look at them and try to find the humanity in there. It's not justifying their actions. That's not the point. Nothing justifies the actions of a panion seer, right? But to look and to look for the humanity and look for the points where you can find compassion and why they deserve our compassion. And the good thing with this book, with Midnight Tides, is that we really see Rulad's transformation. We really see Rulad's um, development as a character. Um, so we can look at all these things and see how they turn him into the person that he is and look at how, like, why he deserves compassion and how much of what he does was actually inevitable. That's the point. It's like, how many choices does Rulat actually have? Or by the point where he gets a choice, how much of a choice is it at the point when the crippled god offers him the sword? How much of a chance did he have, actually have to say no there, right? That's the interesting thing to look at I feel here something I want to continue to look at is the humanity of Rulad and why he, um, when he makes choices and how much of these things are actually choices and how much of that is just reacting and act, yeah, reacting to outside pressures. That's something I feel might be well worth looking at. I also want to look closer at Udinas. Udinas has always been a very, very difficult character for me to get uh, to get into. For some uh, slightly similar reason that like characters like Felicin are difficult. Udinas is definitely someone who is not above lashing out. Sometimes I feel. Um, and he's definitely one of those characters that hits rather close to home in a lot of ways. Um, there's this great video that Counselor of Moonspawn did on the depiction of depression within the Tist Andy. But I feel that there is also something to be said about depression within, the, like the depiction of depression or um, something very similar in Udinas, and it's actually something that I've like probably personal experience with both like firsthand and secondhand and whatever you want to call it um, with a lot of people in my personal circles that um, struggle with um, how to say um, the um, Now, I'm trying to find words here, and it's not easy. Um, people that struggle with the fact that they are rather aware of their the world surrounding them. Um, people that you that are considered very intelligent and smart by, uh, from the outside, from from uh, by other people. I'm not talking about myself here. Don't worry. Um, and what happens if such people? Um, kind of realize or think that whatever they do is basically uh, bound to fail and there is when that despair sets in in a way and i feel and 
there's that's the point we we get a lot of like Udina's inner monologues there and to realize and, and, and how he struggles with the economic despair and all these other things and I feel like that might just be a thing because of my personal circles and because I obviously um run around in more um like have a lot of connections to academic circles so there's a lot of people there who are very much prone to um, reflect and vocalize or sometimes at least vocalize those reflections and stuff like that. Um, point there is um, that that makes it sometimes very difficult and very hard to read about Udinas. Um, there might be a full video on Udinas in there somewhere. If so, it'll be at a later point when we see more of his character. Um, and on that note, I want to finish for today and uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow about something. Might be Discworld, might be Malazan book, uh, might be Midnight Tides book three, might be something else. But I guess it's either one of those. So until then, have a great Thursday evening. Um, uh, cheers.